Savior, 
more to tell what he knows. Wants more to tell it, what I embrace. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. Yeah, amen. All right, let's start off with a word of prayer. Yes, Lord. God, all we are in this room are just only sinners, Lord. We're not great. All we are are sinners washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. The praises you heard today are from rotten sinners saved by your grace, and I pray that you felt glorified through that. Unworthy vessels we are when you have the four cherubs and you have all the host of the angels and you got people who are made holy up in heaven. But you would use wretched sinners like us to lift up our voices and give you the glory. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit will overflow in this room today and that you will fill within me with power. I pray that no one here will bring a hindrance of the spirit and that the spirit will freely overflow and that you would be magnified, you would be glorified, you would be honored, and you would be praised because thou art worthy, O Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Okay, if you'll take out your white hymnal, your white hymnal, and turn to page 9, please. Turn to page 9. So this is, it's been a while since we sang this song, page 9. We will sing all three verses, all three verses. If you think that your life in Jesus Christ is easy, man, you're really wrong right there. Some of you are going through hard times. Ever since you got saved, all of a sudden bad things start happening to you. And you got to realize it's not an easy road when you serve Jesus Christ. But when you pass through all that rubble, all those steep roads that you have to climb up, at the end of it, you see something greater. Page 9 in your white hymnal. Here we go. It's not an easy road we are traveling to heaven for many are the thorns on the way. It's not an easy road but the Savior is with us. His presence gives us joy every day. No, no, it's not an easy road. No,
this faster. <laughs> okay. So good morning, San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Those of you who are here today physically and online, I'm looking at you online viewers. Thank you for supporting us. God bless you for watching us. And here are our announcements for today. So Friday Bible study will be at 8 p.m. And discipleship will be an hour earlier at 7 p.m. And it will be at Pastor's House again. Um, again, it's Friday. I didn't mention it one time to one, one brother, and I'm sorry about that. But it's on Friday, so don't come, don't come on Monday. It's on Friday. <laughs> Sometimes the days keep changing, so I'll emphasize the day. Um, next Sunday, it'll be street preaching. It'll be 10.30 a.m. on the same corner with Chevron. Always park at Chevron because it's easier to get back to church. Um, and we'll have street preaching there at 10.30 to 11.30. Our memory verse is going to be the latter half of Psalms, chapter 23, and we're going to memorize the whole chapter. And I got a little, uh, I got a bit ahead of you guys, so I'm going to quote the verses for you, okay? So, Psalms chapter 23, and it goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Okay, he restoreth my soul. Hold on, I know this. Okay, he restoreth my soul, and he lead, leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, and the, the, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil; my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house forever, or house of the Lord forever, not in the house. <laughs> Okay, okay. It wasn't perfect, but I have I have it mostly down. So I hope this almost King James, Amen. <laughs> just like the NKJ. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I hope that will kind of encourage you guys to keep up with your reading memory verses, because by the end of like two months, you might be surprised. You can probably quote three chapters in the Bible. So that'll be a huge blessing for some of you. Now we're gonna have a special, and I will call up those. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise our standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm everyone, rest your cause upon his holy word. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light, battling for the right we ne'er can fail. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. O thou God of all, hear us when we call, help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. So if Brother Sean can come forward and take up the Lord's offering for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us all here safely today. I pray for anyone still on their way that you would see them safely to church. Yes. Lord, we've uh, we spent a lot of time here, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us um, in the future of this church, yes, where you, would, Lord, where you would have us to end up, Lord yes. God. And uh, I pray that it would be for no other reason than for your continued uh, will, for your purpose, for the purpose of seeing souls saved, yes. and for the purpose of giving people Bible-believing truth in these Amen. last days Amen. when we need it so much, Lord. I pray that you would take this free will offering and that it would be given with uh, love and not a necessity, Lord, but a cheerful giving. And I pray that uh, the money given today would be put to use um, to 
to lead more souls to salvation and to just continue to grow this church in whatever way you see fit, okay. not necessarily with more members, but the fruits. That's what yes. we w- want growing, Lord. Please fill a pastor with Holy Ghost unction and spiritual power today. Soften each and every one of our hearts. Uh, have it to really convict us, Lord, so that it will make us better in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And have us to go about this next week serving you the best way we can. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Open your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy. We'll look at chapter 2, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We will read verse 18. Verse 18. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18. One of those blue moon sermons where I get excited. Amen? All right, you're going to get it today. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. So you're not going to hear me do the the traditional way how I do things. You're going to see me uh, get excited, do some crazy things in this message. Some of it might scare you, you know, because you're used to seeing a preacher who smiles and talks in a very low volume, like volume number 5. And then, you know, acts all prestigious and nice. No, once in a while, uh, I give a shouting, old-fashioned sermon right here. And I hope that you will enjoy it. It will pump up your blood because you need that blood pumped up because you've been too much drugged down by the world, by the flesh, by the devil. And you need that blood pumped up. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18. Who concerning the truth have who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So in this passage, there are two particular individuals, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And what these two individuals did is that they started to overthrow the faith of some Christians that were already past the resurrection. And what we can learn here is that there are Christians today whose faith have been wavering, overthrown because they their resurrection in Jesus Christ are not living in it they don't believe that they're alive instead they act like dead individual sobs who can't do anything for Jesus Christ and you got to realize you got to stop sobbing about yourself sobbing about your afflictions and thinking that everything is dead to you you're acting as if the resurrection is past already you're acting as if Jesus raised himself from the tomb and there's nothing more to shout about after that you think there's nothing alive to talk about the resurrection of our lord and savior jesus christ when you're trying to deliver somebody's soul from a burning hell you treat like the resurrection is past already oh do you remember back in the days of san jose bible baptist church when we would get excited when we would get hundreds of souls saved and all of us would get together and pray the Lord's power upon this room, and we'd all get fired up. No, I don't like to talk like that. You talk as if San Jose Bible Baptist Church was back in the old glory days. You talk as if, oh, you remember when you got saved, when you got a passion for Jesus Christ, and you want to pass out tracts and uh, sell, sell away all the world and sell out yourself to Jesus Christ, and you didn't care. No, 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 I'm tired of that. You act as if that's already been in the past. You act like the resurrection's in the past already, rather than in the present. You're alive in Jesus Christ. The yes. fire is still in you. Yes. The Holy Spirit is still sealed within you till the day of redemption. Yes. Jesus Christ, his blood is still pumping within you yes. and you've got the power, the filling power of the Holy Spirit. you got a resurrection inside. Did you not know that? The Apostle Paul wrote all over the scriptures that you are having, you have the power, the power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead within every one of you. You all didn't know that, didn't you? You all have that. That's why this flesh is considered dead to us, and our spiritual nature is considered to be alive. And if you don't believe it, when you look at yourself at the rapture, you'll believe it. That resurrected power within is hidden with, within inside, and one day it will unlock itself and transform your body to be the, the glorious resurrected body of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
you know what you got in you? You got something that's alive and kicking. And you got to kick out the devil. You got to kick out the deadness. You got to kick out the flesh. And you got to realize that you're alive and kicking. And by the grace of God, I will still be alive and kicking as I keep preaching God's truth and keep proclaiming the gospel and teaching Bible-believing truth. And I don't care if people get offended and walk out mad and we continue Amen. to be small or people online will start unsubscribing. By the grace of God, this preacher will still keep on being alive and keep and kicking. And I hope you will join with me. May San Jose Bible Baptist Church be alive and kicking in this dead, liberal, carnal, worldly, platonic world, San Francisco Bay Area that we live in. You know what you see outside? Tombstones. All around you, cemeteries and tombstones. There's only one small location here that's still alive, and that's right here, San Jose Bible yeah. Baptist Church. All right, let's not treat this like a graveyard. I'm not going to give you a graveyard sermon. I'm going to give you a resurrected sermon. Amen. Alive and kicking. God, my Father, wash away my sins with your holy blood. And God, I pray that you'll just chip off away the deadness from me. Melt away the tiredness and the devils away and the flesh, the feelings of the flesh. May the Holy Spirit take full control and take over. I pray today's sermon will give you the glory. Wash away my sins with your blood and fill within me the power of your spirit. And may Jesus be magnified above all else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, my first point is my Savior. My Savior. You know, in Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. You know why you're alive? Because you got a living Savior. That's why. That's all that matters. That's the reason why you're alive yes, and kicking. Because you got a living Savior within you. And if you got a living Savior within you, you got to realize this that you have that living nature, that living power, but you have, you have failed to use it. You have failed to use it even once. You let the deadness of your flesh run all over you, and you didn't let the living Savior take full control. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 reads, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You know, Jesus Christ is right inside you. But some of you put him at a distance that you don't let him come inside your heart. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And if you'll just let him in, man, he can fill you up. Man, he can make you alive. But see, you don't ponder that he's really with you. So because you don't really ponder that he's with you, that's why you live your life dead and not resurrected. You ever wonder why you always live your life dead and down in the dumps and like the devil drained your energy? Because you don't really, you don't really see that Jesus is with you. And when you see that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus is really with you, you feel so alive. Let me give you some examples right here. For example, you wouldn't, you wouldn't mess around with sin if you felt like the Lord Jesus Christ was really with you. And when you felt like that the Lord Jesus Christ is really with you and you saw him visibly and you see his chastening rod right above your head, you know what you would do? You would think twice before you touch that something else. That's see, that's the reason why your life is dead. It's not alive. Why? Because you don't really treat that Jesus is really with you. Amen. What about this, for example? What about why, why aren't you coming to church? Why aren't you passing out tracts? Why aren't you coming to street preaching and visitation? Why aren't you reading your Bible? Why aren't you praying? You know why? Because you don't really treat that Jesus is really with you. And if, you've, if you will be terrified at the judgment seat of Christ because Jesus is right in front of you, how can you not be terrified when Jesus is inside you? And when you treat that Jesus is that real, that awesome in power, not in front of you at the judgment seat of Christ, but really inside you, then you would, th you would be double motivated to start opening up that book and reading that book and getting on your knees and praying and getting yourself ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Here's another thing is that why would you be afraid about what people think about you as street preaching? What, for holding a sign? 
for participating, for passing out tracts, for preaching on the streets. If Jesus was really with you and you saw that awesome sword of God, that those great big arms of Jesus Christ wrapped around you, you wouldn't feel that afraid when you're street preaching at a bunch of people who are making fun of you and looking down on you. If Jesus was that alive to you. If Jesus was really that much alive to you, then you know what? You wouldn't be depressed when you see those bills running higher. You wouldn't get depressed when you didn't do well at school, when you're not doing well at work. You wouldn't be depressed when your family starts criticizing you and turning against you. You wouldn't. If Jesus was really that much alive to you because you would see him hugging you, you would see him saying, I'm with you, don't worry, everything's all right. And if he was that much alive and real to you as if he's hugging you right now and saying, everything's all right, child, I am still on the throne, I got a plan and a purpose for you, and don't worry and don't fear, then you would not act like a dead Christian down in the dumps and giving up on Jesus Christ when suffering hits. Yeah. And when suffering hits and Jesus is that much alive and real to you, you can take head on any suffering that hits on you. If Jesus was that much alive to you, but you're not alive, you're not kicking, you're dead. You got to realize this is that, man, when you compare everything of this world compared to your living Savior, all of that stuff in the world, all that stuff in your life is dead. There is nothing in your life worth living. There is absolutely nothing in your life worth living, worth alive, compared to the living Savior. I mean, have you compared the two? Have you ever compared the two in your life so that you can feel like a resurrected Christian? Think about all other priorities in your life. Think about everything else in your life. You know, your job, your lover, your friends, your money. I mean, think about all that. They're all worth dead compared to Jesus Christ. Amen. So why not make him alive to you? And why not make the world dead to you instead of making the world alive to you and Jesus dead to you? You know what Jesus said at John chapter 10, verse 28? No man can pluck them out of my hand. I mean, I tell you what, I mean, Jesus Christ, he has you eternally secured and that hand of the Lord Jesus Christ got you locked up in your salvation. And you don't have to worry a day in your life about, did I lose my salvation? Oh, I wonder if I really got saved. Oh, man, I committed this sin. Did I get caught off from my salvation? And when your eyes got open to dispensational truth and the King James Bible issue, you believed every word in that book and which dispensation it applied to. And because of that, you had no fear about losing your salvation. You felt the assurance and the peace of God. And that don't get you alive in Jesus Christ. That don't get you shouting that don't get you rejoicing that praise the Lord I can go to bed every night without worrying about losing my soul in a burning hell you're eternally secure he's got you locked in his hand that don't get you happy that don't get you excited oh, oh man I lost my house well I didn't lose my salvation That's right, bless man. God hallelujah That's good. oh I lost my money well thank God I didn't lose my gold up in heaven you got to realize this, you have not lost your salvation. You will never lose your salvation, even though the gates of hell will open up its bars and empty all of its devils inside. None of them can ever shake you off the hand of Jesus Christ. And you can have a million devils, a legion upon legion, upon legion of devils, shaking the arm of Jesus Christ, telling him to let go. But Jesus Christ says, no way, Gene Kim is stuck in there. I ain't letting go. You're not even going to let loose one little finger Amen. Jesus Christ he he's got you eternally secure that don't get you alive that don't get you kicking think about Hebrews 13 and verse 5 he also says he will never leave you nor forsake you man isn't that a blessing isn't that something to feel alive and to give him the glory about that he will never leave you nor forsake you he could have just left you eternally secured but he did not have to be with you every day seeing all the sins that you commit in your life all the times that you let him down and don't give him the glory all the time that you love something else more than loving jesus christ he didn't have to see all that he didn't have to live through all that but he decided to stay with you no matter what and when you're living right or when you're sinning, 
When you're loving someone else more than God, or you love God more than someone else, Jesus Christ is with you through thick and thin, through rain or sunshine. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Man, that doesn't get you happy. That doesn't get you excited that when you let the Lord Jesus Christ down, he just pats your shoulder and said, I'm not leaving you still. Wow. And then we, we act all dead and we act all platonic that Jesus is not alive and real to us. Come on, man. Be alive. Be kicking. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I can shout out hallelujah tenfold just on that one verse when Jesus says, hey, I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you. And I can say glory to God over and over again when he says that to me. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. Woo, this is good stuff. Our living Savior said he makes intercessions in our prayers to God's will. Man, ain't that a blessing that when you're praying to the Lord and you, you don't know how to pray. Some of you don't know how to pray. Some of you are still afraid to pray in front of the church because you feel like you don't know how to pray. And when you're fumbling and you're mumbling and you're like, I don't say the right words, Jesus Christ says, it's okay, I know which right words to say to God. And he will deliver those words up to the Lord. He will deliver them up to the Father. And the Son will tell the Father, Father God, this is what Gene Kim's trying to say right here. This is what he really means right here. And he is my intercessor. When I can't persuade the mind of God, Jesus Christ comes in and intercedes on my behalf and tries to persuade the Father for me. I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ that as I wrote my prayer request down on this piece of paper, and I say, can you deliver this to the Father? You know what Jesus Christ did? I want to thank God that Jesus Christ took that paper of my prayer request and took out a red pen and said, eh, wrong, 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 yeah, wrong, and put corrections right here, amen. put corrections right here, couldn't put, put corrections right here, and he goes to the oh, Father, yeah. and he says, Father God, this is what Gene Kim really means right here. This is what Gene Kim really needs right here. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what's best for him. So, Father God, here it is. Will you meet that prayer according to your will? And the Father will answer it according to his will. And every prayer request that I get answered will be according to the Father's will and for my betterment and for my best. I, man, that is something to be alive. That is something to be worth kicking because I got an intercessor on my behalf who delivers a prayer better than I can deliver the prayer to the Father. First John chapter 1 and verse 7 and 9 shows right there that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You got to realize, my friend, that that's a wonderful promise that I can't believe it. I can't believe that you would be down and depressed when you claim the blood for forgiveness. You should rejoice. You should shout. I know you're a wretch. I, you should feel guilty. You should be repentant about the sins you committed. You should be disgusted with your repetitive actions. But my friend, when Jesus Christ says, I love you and I forgive you, and he wipes your slate clean with his blood, that is something not to be depressed about, but to lift up your hands and give him the glory and say, thank you, God, for forgiving me again. He is faithful, faithful, faithful to forgive you of your sin. Oh, I want to thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are faithful to forgive me of my sins. Every time I let you down, God won't let me down. Every time that I put, put Jesus Christ down, God puts me back up again. And God will make sure that I don't stay down. And he'll put me back up because that blood lifts higher and higher and will put me on higher ground and man i can live for jesus christ again you know there think about all the things of this world can they ever forgive you even your best friend if you committed the same action and wrongdoing the hundredth time do you think that close friend of yours will say i forgive you after that but there is one person who will and that is jesus christ Man, compare anything to this world. Compare anything to this world. There is no being, no other person, no being who will say, I will forgive you again. John chapter 14, verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Man, that's something to be worth alive, worth kicking. I mean, think about it. Jesus Christ got you 
a mansion up in heaven. That's, that's something to be alive. That's something to rejoice and to shout about, not be down, not depressed. Yeah. I can't believe it. You come to church, you hear a verse, in my father's house are many mansions. Some of you are still going, oh. Yeah, come on, preach. Oh, oh, you just don't understand, preacher, what I'm going through. Oh, uh, what in the world, man? He if I told you right here, instead of quoting you John 14, 2, if I told you, hey, guess what? You got a mansion up over there in Beverly Hills. You'd go psycho. You'd jump out yeah, of your seat. Right. You'd say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you can't do that for your mansion up in heaven? Yeah, that, is, that is pure gold. That's Beverly right. Hills, they can't even pay that thing with pure gold. But Jesus Christ got your mansion, streets paved with pure gold. I mean, it is, un it is beyond anything you ever saw before. And that is something to be excited and say thank you, God, about. Amen. Not over your dumb mansion. I mean, people just go psycho and nuts if they at least get a house here yep. in the Bay Area. And here you go, oh, I finally got a house. And, and you got a mansion, you're like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Like a lot of hundreds and thousands of people in their churches. When the pastor quotes him, John 14, 2, I guess he's reading NIV when he says, in my father's house are many rooms. And they're like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, Maybe God. that's why. That's why they're all dead. They're depressed. Oh, yeah, I don't need another room. Yeah. You know what I want? I want a mansion. I want a mansion. That is something to be worth excited about. Think about it, folks. You got more than Bill Gates. Yeah. You got more than Mark Zuckerberg. Right. You got more property, more room. You got better Ooh. buildings than all the Hollywood Ooh. celebrities put together. Ain't that something to be excited about? Amen. Because when you compare the things of this world, that's what you fail to do. You fail to compare the things of this life, the things of this world, compared to your living Savior, what he prepared for you. When you compare the two, then you realize that you are acting like spoiled princes and princesses, and you'd realize, man, I had so much more all this time, and I just never pondered about it. I just never lived for it. I just never gave God the glory for it compare the things of this world to the living savior it's nothing john 14 verse 27 jesus christ he promised you to give you peace peace i give unto you peace i leave with you not as the world giveth give i unto you man that is worth saying amen to because this world tries to give you peace i mean they 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 pump you up with drugs trying to make things better when it's actually contaminating your health worse. They're trying to, they give, they have, you know, the parents can't control their kids, so then they give the television to give them that peace to calm them down with. You know, the internet and the technology and the video games to give them that peace. People, they turn to alcohol. People, they turn to smoking. People, they turn to fornication. They turn to the things of this world to give them peace in their mind. And there's a psychologist out there who has his or her own psychologist out there because everyone is seeking peace. But what things of this world can give you peace when the Lord Jesus Christ is the person that can give you peace all that time? And Jesus Christ says, I give you a peace that's beyond this world because all you have to do is just dump it on my shoulders and let me take care of it. Let me worry about it. Let me think about how to handle it. And you, my child, all you have to do is rest in my arms. You had the greatest medicine that gave you peace, and that is Jesus Christ. And all you had to do was stay in it, relax in it. But no, you relax yourself in the feeling of the drugs, the feeling of that booze. The words, the soothing words of a psychologist or Joel Osteen saying, Jesus loves you, smile, everything's all right. And Oprah Winfrey goes, yes, this is just great stuff so that we can all have a maintain a positive attitude of I can, yes, I can. No, I don't need Oprah, I don't need Joel Osteen, I don't need the drugs, I don't need some, the, some soothing words of a psychologist or those soothsayers or fortune tellers to tell me my future. I got the word of God that tells my future and the Lord Jesus Christ who secured my future and his words are more than enough to soothe the ache in my soul. Peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth. How many times have you quoted that verse, huh, when you're going through hard times? Have you ever started to listen to the words of Jesus? No, you made Jesus dead to you. You left Jesus on that cross. 
You left Jesus Christ on that cross, and you would not let him come down and be a living Savior, come out of that dead tomb, that dead sepulcher inside you. That scripture, Jesus Christ says, you are dead sepulchers inside, he said. Some of you just dead sepulchers inside, and you won't let Jesus walk out of that dead tomb and be alive to you. Can you hear him now? Can you finally hear him now after all that honking of the horns through traffic, all those noise of the people at the workplace? Can you finally hear his voice saying, I give you peace? Man, compare anything of this world to Jesus Christ. Nothing can. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, there is no person that can carry your burden than Jesus Christ. You know what people want to do? People want someone else to carry the burden for them. People, nowadays, that's why they're dumping everything on the government. Because why? People don't want to take responsibility for their actions, and they think Big Brother out there can provide them some free handout, take care of them, and they don't have the Savior to carry their burdens, to carry their Lord's loads. You try to dump it on a person, and you go, well, this person really loves me, so I can tell him or her my problems. And all of that pressure inside, you just want to speak it out, right? And you're like, man, if there's someone that can hear me out, and then you tell it to somebody, and the person who hears it says, man, you're nuts. I don't want to hear your problems, man. I got enough problems on my shoulders. Please don't tell me your problems. And then you feel like that no one understands your feelings. No one understands exactly what you're going through. And not even the pastor can, you got to understand. But my friend, there is a best friend out there named Jesus Christ. And that person will understand every feeling, every thought, everything you're going through. And he can carry your burdens. And when you dump and tell him everything that you're going through, guess what? Jesus Christ is still there hearing you out. When you tell it to your friend, you know, there are these people who are drunk in a bar. And they just want to pour all their sob stories, all that they're going through, to some bartender. Some bartender, what's he going to do? Just give you another drink. What's he going to do, solve your problems? But they just want someone to carry the burdens. And they'll go blah, 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 say everything that's going on in their life. And what can the bartender do? Just give him another spirit to drown his sorrows. That's all he can do. And you have to give him money for it as well. But Jesus Christ, he makes it free. Yes, sir. And he listens to you 24-7. And, you know, there's that bartender says, oh, we're closing down. You got to get out. <laughs> Jesus Christ says, no, it's still open. And, let, and I'll let you drink of my spirit freely. And let the Holy Spirit let freely flow like water. And keep drinking up, son. And guess what? When, when you pour out all your tears and you can't cry anymore, guess what? Jesus Christ is still there to listen to you. You're not done. You're not done. Because Jesus Christ is still right there for you. Compare anything of this world, man. Nothing, right? It's all dead, isn't it? Everything is dead out there except Jesus Christ. That's why there's so much to live for, so much to be excited about. My second point is my scriptures. Oh, excuse me. I forgot a, an illustration right here. Come on. Come on, Can you imagine your living Savior who conquered death and the grave for you? He is such a living Savior, and you got to realize that everything of this world, they're dead in their tombs, and they're nothing. And here goes Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross, and then he was buried in his tomb. And the one who conquered everybody, his name was Grave. And Grave conquered everyone, and Grave started to go throughout the tombs. And when Grave started to go throughout the tombs, he's like, I got so-and-so right there. I got so-and-so right there. There's Mohammed still buried on the ground where he belongs. Those Muslims lost without hope because their savior is in the ground. Oh, there's Joseph Smith. Yep, he's still buried. He's still in the tomb. I got him too. And the grave looks at the tomb of Buddha and says, he's still rotten in that ground. I got him too. I got every religious founder that ever lived. He went to the tomb of Mary. He says, I got Mary still down there. He went to the tomb of John the Baptist. Oh, there's John the Baptist still right there. Mary Baker Eddy. Yep, she's still buried in that tomb. I got her too. And then he started to walk over to the next tombstone, the next tombstone. Yep, I got right there Elvis Presley. Yep, I got right there Adolf Hitler. Yep, I got right there Marilyn Monroe. Yep, right there, I got 
all these big shots, all these celebrities, no one actually conquered my grave. There's Alexander the Great, he conquered nearly the whole world, and I conquered him. He's still on the ground and buried. There's a world's most, one of the most brilliant persons, Albert Einstein, I got him too. I conquered everybody. And then he went over to the tombstone of Jesus. And then when he looked at the tombstone of Jesus, he didn't see anybody in the grave. So then he starts to take out a shovel and start to dig a hole. Couldn't find him. Dig a couple feet down, and he's like, not there. Digs a couple more feet down, he's not, not there. He starts to dig a couple hundred feet down, and he's like, not there. Where's the body? Where's the body? I got everybody. Where's this one body that I can't get named Jesus? Start to dig down all the way to hell. And he started to look throughout hell if he still got Jesus Christ. And you know what the grave saw? Grave saw Mohammed still burning and frying down there. He saw Buddha still burning in hell and frying down there. He saw Joseph Smith right there still burning in hell and frying down there. He saw Pope John Paul, Pope so-called the innocent. He saw the Pope here and all the 23rd Popes and all the Popes throughout history. He saw them still burning right there. And it's like, I got them all here, but where's Jesus? Where's Jesus Christ? And then the grave went to hell, and he says, you know, I see everybody down here, but where's Jesus? And hell said, oh, let me tell you something right here. We did have Jesus. We did have him for a while. But, you know, when Jesus right was down in hell, I mean, he wasn't frying in the flames like all these other lost people were. He was going throughout, he was going across, going to those Old Testament saints. And I had them all bowed, uh, barred down in the underworld. But then Jesus Christ, he was calm. And I was like, you can't get out of here. Day number one passed. And I was like, see, Jesus, you're still in my bars. You can't get out of here. But Jesus Christ was still calm. And I was so worried. I was like wondering, why won't, what's the matter with him? Why is he so calm? And then hell was getting a little paranoid. He checked the bars if they were still locked up. He looked at his drawers to see if the keys were still there. He's like, I, well, I still got them right here. Day number two, Jesus was still down there. And Jesus Christ was calm. And hell's like, see, you're still down here. And Jesus Christ says, oh, you better check your gates. Not for long. And hell was getting paranoid. And hell got all these security cameras set up on each and every room. He kept an eye on Abraham's bosom. He kept an eye on all the people throughout the underworld. He checked the bars. He double-checked the bars. He made sure that the fence was wired and that he put electric, he put electricity all over it. He had demons and minions surrounding the place. And he's like, he can't get out. He can't get out of here. And then day number three happened. And then hell checked everything. And then he opened up his drawers. And when he opened up the drawers, the grave asked him, grave asked hell, so what did you see? And then hell said, when I opened up the drawers, I noticed that my keys were missing. And my keys were missing, and I was freaking out. And then I, all of a sudden, I see bars opening up across at Abraham's bosom. And I see souls coming out of there. And then there's a person leading them, leading them. And he's holding the keys. And he says, looking for this, looking for this. And here goes Jesus Christ. And I kept him barred. And I had those demons surrounding him. But like a... But Jesus Christ, he just passed through them. And he just, like a sword, cutting through. And the, the gates of hell opened up. And the demons made way for the king. And then that ground, he went through up and up and up through the ground. And got out of the ground. And he got out of hell. And he took those saints out from below hell into the third heaven. And hell said, I'm sorry, I don't know what I can tell you. I don't know what I can tell you. He's not here. He's not here. And you know what the grave could do? All the grave could do was just climb up out of hell. And then there went those disciples. And there went the women sobbing and weeping. Where is our Savior? He's dead. What we're going to do? Our Christianity is dead. There's nothing worth living for. Why bother singing hymns anymore? Why keep coming to church? Why keep street preaching? Why do visitation? I'm going through immense suffering in my household. The bills are getting higher. My friends and loved ones turned against me. Jesus is dead to me. What am I going to do? What am I go going to do? And as these disciples kept weeping about everything going on bad in their life, thinking that Jesus is dead to them, 
Grave walked out of the tomb and Grave told them, you can't find the savior here. He is not here for he is risen. And I'm going to tell you something, church. Jesus Christ is risen. He is not dead. Why are you acting like a bunch of disciples who, who is making a trip to the sepulcher to see a dead body of Jesus, to see a dead Christianity, to see a dead church? It's not in the tomb. You're looking in the wrong place. He is alive. He is living. You'll never find him there. You'll never find Jesus there. You will never find Jesus there in your depression, in your discouragement, down in the dumps. You will never find Jesus there. He's not there. He is risen. Where are you looking at? Where are you looking at? You're looking at the wrong place. You know why I can be alive? Because of my scriptures. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to realize that the reason why you can be alive and kicking is because the scriptures are alive to you. And if you make the scriptures alive to you, you'd be more alive than ever before. Didn't you know that? You might say, well, I don't think so. No. For example, if you're going through like a really hard time and you feel like everything is dying all around you and you believed every word, every word, you believed every word that is spoken out, of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And if you believed every word that is spoken out of Romans 8, 28, you would not be discouraged. You would not be depressed. You would not be dead. Oh, yeah, I quoted that verse. Yeah, you quoted that verse because you just skimmed through it. You just said it. You didn't put faith in every word. And if you believed every word in that verse, you'd be more alive. For example, the judgment seat of Christ, it calls it the terror of the Lord, right? If you believed in that word carefully and believed it with all of your heart, the terror of the Lord, knowing ourselves, the terror of the Lord, therefore we persuade men and I trust are made manifest in your conscience. And you believed every word in that verse, you'd be more careful where you go, what you say, and what you're doing in your life. See, you'd be more alive in Jesus Christ if you believed every word in that verse. But you didn't, didn't you? You did not believe every word in that verse. And that's why you live your life dead. Dead. Why are you living dead? Why can't you be alive in Jesus Christ? Because you don't believe every word in that verse, period. That's it. You don't believe every word in that verse, period. Let the scriptures come out alive to you when you're reading the Bible. Let every word sink in. I mean, think about it. Compare everything in this world to the scriptures. There is nothing in this world that can compete or parallel with the living scriptures. Nothing of this world. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, being born, of, being born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Have you ever seen a book that can spiritually awaken your soul? That can clean off the deadness in you? Have you ever met a book like that? Did you ever meet any other book? Did, did the Quran do that for you? No, it just makes you kill more people. That's what it does, the Quran. This book, it makes, it makes you more alive. It lives, it livens more people. Have you, uh, you... You get all the joy out of reading these school textbooks? Oh, knowledge, knowledge. This is what changed our world, changed our universe. We're progressing society through all these textbooks. And when you read these textbooks, you feel more dead and more dead and more dead, and you feel like blowing your brains out after that. But this book, it will never grow old, and it always livens you up. This thing made you born again. Do you think a Superman comic book saved your soul from hell or a regular King James Bible that saved your soul from hell? It's that book, the King James Bible. It has the power to save souls. Compare anything else in this world. Can you? Can you compare anything else in this world that can liven you up? Nope. Nothing, absolutely nothing in this world can liven you up except the King James Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter eight, verse four, it says, where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. Power. You got to realize there is no other book, no other book 
like our King James Bible, that has such power. Power. There is power and authority in the words. You read your NIV. You read your NASV. You read your new King James Version, the ESV. Can every word come out alive to you? Does it have authority? Does it have power? The and thou. I don't like the these and thous. Well, those words, you say it because it has power. Say you, 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 you every verse. It don't sound powerful to me. Why is it that people, when they poke fun at Christianity, they'll start to use King James language? Exactly. Oh, thou doest the tawdry things and stuff like that. Why would they talk like that to make fun and poke fun at Christianity? Because they know that kind of wording is what is connected with the living Christianity. Those kind of wording gives power. Why would they want to say go to H-E-double-L -L when they cuss? Why don't you say Hades like the New King James Version, huh? Why don't you say Hades like the ESV, the NIV? Go to Hades. You think that has power? No, it's hell. That's why people want to say hell when they cuss. You know why? Because it has power. It has authority. Why don't they take the name of Muhammad in vain? Why don't they take the name of Buddha in vain? Why does it always have to be the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they cuss out and take in the name in vain? You know why? Because they know it has power. It has authority. Amen. That's why. They have to use Jesus' name. That's how pitiful, that's how low down they are, that some atheist who hates God, yeah. he can't help but respect the authority of the name of Jesus Christ Amen. every time Amen. he opens his mouth and uses a cuss word. It's that name that has authority. That name that has power is Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6 through 7, it says that the word of is what preserved thy word is preserved it is preserved forever the words of the lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times thou shalt keep them O lord thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever name me any other book name me any other book a science book a history book math book any book that outlived the bible Name me any artifact out there that lived the Bible, outlived the Bible. This book was preserved, every word preserved, throughout the beginning to the end. There is no other book like this book. Manuscript evidence wells up to thousands upon thousands, and the ancient witnesses support this King James Bible. There is no other book that parallels to that. You take your science textbook. Oh, the science textbooks, they're more accurate than the Bible. No, it's not because you revised it for the seventh time and you had to have a bunch of scientists stick their heads together and then to revise their science textbook all over again. But this book, this book, unchanging, preserved, yes, preserved from this generation forever. You can believe every word in that book. There is no other book like the King James Bible. There is no other book like this. See, compare anything to this world, of this world to the Bible that you hold in your hand. It's absolutely nothing, worth nothing. Think about Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. That book has the power to change a sinner. Boy, that is something unbelievable. Have you ever seen a book that changes a person's life? Oh, you read Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now. Oh, it changed my life forever. Really? Really? That guy with his tone of voice, the way he words things? If you read his book, I'll bet you that you think it's a woman who wrote the book. Amen. I mean, you, you read that kind of stuff? You think it changes your life? It's life-changing? Oh, you know, uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to my comic book so that I, uh, let me turn to my comedy, comedy comics so that I can get a good laugh, so that I can liven me up. There is no book that has the power to change a sinner. Yes, sir. There is no book that can, has the power to change a sinner. You know how this book changed so many atheists' lives? How many atheist books have changed a Christian's life? Got them to quit drinking, smoking. Got them to live a clean life. Got them to sing hymns. Got, them, got a man who was beating up his wife and children. Got him to be transformed into a loving husband and a loving father. Name me a book where I got a person who is educated into school and into high intellectual class and wants to read the book, bowed on his knees and received Jesus Christ for his salvation and prioritized the book more than his education. Name me any other book in the, book, in the world. There is absolutely nothing. You can't find any single book out there in the world that can outclass the Bible. There is no book like our book. It has the power to change a sinner's life. 
You have someone that you're praying for. You have someone that you want to get saved, and you're saying, Lord, be merciful to that poor sinner right there. Save his or her soul from hell. My friend, that book has the power to change your loved one's life. It has the power to change your son's life, your daughter's life, your husband's life, your wife's life, your mother's life, your father's life, your brother's life, your sister's life, your best friend's life. This book has the power to change the hardest of hearts. There is no other book like this book. See, when you compare everything in this world to this book, it's nothing. It's dead to you. What about Psalms chapter 119 and verse 11? It says that thy word hath, have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That verse says that the book has a power to what? It saves you from sin. Name me any book in this world that saves you from your addiction, that cleanses you of sin. That when you commit something wrong and you feel so filthy and rotten, name me a book that you open up and you feel like everything is filtered out and the gunk is cleaned out. And that words of that King James Bible starts hitting your eyes and then your mind starts to think about it and meditate upon it and just cleans it all off. It just cleans it all off. There is nothing in this world that can clean you up. You think drugs can clean you up? More drugs that the doctors prescribe to you can give you victory over your depression, over certain addictions that you're going through? Do you think that the words of a psychologist can help you conquer and clean up your sin? Do you think that group therapy and getting together where everybody talks about their dirty secrets can help you clean up your life? Do you think the words of your religion can help you clean up your life? Or is it the book, this book right here, the book, this book can clean up your sin. This book can clean up your life, what you're struggling with. There is nothing in this world that can clean up your fill except this book right here. In John chapter 17 and verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The only truth is this book, and this is the final authority for all truth. Name me any other thing in this world that can guide you and lead you into all truth. It's not your schools. It's not your pastors. It's not science. It's not math. Nothing can g give you the full truth and nothing but the truth except this book. The NIV can't give you all the truth. The ESV can't give you all the truth. Guess what? The internet can't give you the truth. Some online viewers need to hear that. The internet does not give you the truth. What gives you the truth is this book right here. Amen. And this is why you're still alive. You're still kicking. You know why you're dead? You know why you feel paranoid? You know why you have no peace? Because you keep watching a screen that drains off your energy and you have a television mindset. Because you listen to everything that your teacher is saying. You don't have time to critique and you have to memorize and write everything down. Because you listen to a deadbeat pastor at church who doesn't don't know even how to preach a lick and you just sit down and you listen and you go uh-huh 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 yeah. it's because of that that's why you got something dead in you and you're not given the truth this book is unparalleled this book you cannot compete yes, sir. gives you the full truth romans 15 verse 4 it says that we through comfort of the scriptures might have hope there is no other book that can give you comfort than the Word of God. The soothsayers, they can't. Your best friend, the best things that they could say, it can't. But this Word, you just open up one verse right there, one verse right there, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You read those words, I mean, it just gives you comfort more than ever before. There's no other book like it that's living and alive that can give you comfort. I can think about the world, the flesh, and sufferings from hell, and they keep tempting in my ear. And the devil keeps telling me to doubt. The devil keeps telling me to get bitter. And he says, why don't you quit out on God? And uh, man, my energy is drained. My heart is dry. And I feel so dead. And there's nothing alive in me. 
But my friend, when the devil starts tempting in your ear and tells you to get bitter and tells you to doubt God and tells you to give up Jesus Christ, what you need to do is stop sobbing and stop being dead. You need to take that book because this book is alive and it will give you life. And you need to open that book. And when you look at the devil, you look at him straight at the face and you start quoting the scripture at him. You start, when you feel like down in the dumps, Oh, isn't God lame to you? Isn't God unfair to you? Isn't everything bad? You're the one that's suffering worse out of everybody else around the world. And then you start quoting to that devil. You look at the devil and say, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. I can keep quoting the verses at him. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are in heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the seat of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another's with these words. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit receive life everlasting. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for Amen. great is your reward in heaven. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when the world, the flesh, and the devil start tempting in your ear, you take that old King James Bible that's alive and you slap the devil out of him. Amen. That's how you get alive. That's how you get kicking. When you feel down in the dumps, start quoting scripture now. Won't you? Will you please? My last point is myself. Myself. You know how you make your Christianity alive is looking at yourself. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says that yourself, your Christian life, it does not seem alive to you. Why? Because you made your spiritual self dead with all these fleshy things. But Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. You got to realize this is that your self, this flesh, needs to be dead and your spirit needs to be alive. You know why you don't feel alive right now? You know why you don't feel like serving Jesus Christ right now? You know why that you, can, you don't feel like that you can live through another day? Because you didn't make yourself alive. And when you would make yourself alive in Jesus Christ, then you can be alive every single day. But no, you've yielded yourself to this world so much to how your flesh feels. That's why you always feel dead around you. You let the devil keep attacking you, and that's why you consistently feel dead around you. Make yourself alive. So by consistently doing spiritual things, you live. You see that? But if you keep doing fleshy things, you die more and more. You know why you're dying? You're doing more fleshy things than spiritual things. And if you would just keep doing the spiritual things, you would be alive in Jesus Christ. Why do you think you're still serving God because you kept coming at least to Sunday services? Why? 
Why do you feel like that there are some things that you can still keep on going? Because you still cling on to something spiritual that keeps you alive. You need to be alive in Jesus Christ. That's why we sing hymns. That's why we sing specials. That's why we glorify God. You know what you need to do when you feel down in the dumps? You need to take out a red hymnal. You need to take out that white hymnal. You need to start lifting up your voice for God. And who cares what your neighbors think about you? And you need to lift up your voice like a trumpet. And you need to sing to the Lord Jesus Christ to keep yourself alive. How can a person feel dead when they're singing about the old account settled long ago? Down on my knees, long ago, I settled it all. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Hallelujah, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Oh, it is marvelous and wonderful what Jesus hath done for this soul of mine. The half has never been told. You feel like you're going to be dead after that? Yes, the old account was settled long ago. Hallelujah. And the record. You think you're going to do that? Sing a hymn, man. You feel dead? You feel depressed? You feel like, oh, I'm depressed. And you're all alone, and no one would talk to you. No one would understand your feelings. You know what you need to do? You need to go outside and meet people now. Go outside, grab some tracks, and tell somebody, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? That would keep yourself alive. That would keep yourself kicking. Go out soul winning, man. Some of you, you feel down in the dumps, and you need to gather with the brethren. You know why you're still struggling with the cigarette addiction? Because you're locking yourself up and keep smoking that cigarette rather than gathering together with the brethren where you can't publicly smoke in front of them. You need to hang around brethren. You try sitting around the brethren after that. When brethren start to talk about Jesus, talk about souls getting saved, talk, talk bad about sin, and they criticize sin, and you try to sit after that. You feel more alive after that. Hang around with the brethren. Every gathering that happens together, you can't bail out. you got to gather together so that you can get something spiritual in your life in Jesus Christ. You need to meditate. Some of you need to just be alone at the garden with God, open up that book, and start talking to Jesus Christ as if you're really talking to him rather than a tradition, rather than mechanical phase, but really talk to him. And then he can become more alive to you. Some of you need to just praise God a bit. That would get you alive. Some of you just, I, I don't care how stupid you look, okay? Look stupid for once, all right? If, if you feel like you're going to look stupid, all right, just lock yourself up in a room, you know? Nobody's in there. No one's looking at you, all right? And when you, when you look, okay, no one's watching me. No one can hear me, all right? Do that. And then uh, start to go like this. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And then raise the volume a couple decibels higher, you know, go, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Yeah. And then, you know, if your body st still feels platonic and dead, you know, after work, start to run around the room a bit, you know. Just go, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, yeah. glory to God, yeah. hallelujah. Some of you, I mean, you need to dance like David did, all right? You know what he did? He was jumping up and down, and he was doing somersaults, and he's praising the Lord Jesus Christ, embarrassed his Southern Baptist Presbyterian wife, Michael. You need to do that. You need to not care, and you need to just go around the room a bit and say hallelujah, lift up your hands, you know, maybe raise the King James Bible and say, wow, glory to God. And maybe five minutes later, at the first, you're going like, glory to God, thank you, Jesus. And five minutes later, you're probably running out of your apartment, running down the stairs going, yeah, glory, hallelujah, I'm saved by the blood. Some of you need to do that. You know what I would do after work? After work, you know, I go, oh, man, I got to go to school after this, and I feel all dead, and then... During traffic hour, I was like, this is nuts. And then I would roll down my windows and then blare up the revival music going on. And I would say, yeah, praise Jesus. Glory to God. And here are these heavy metals right there blaring up their music. And they got scared and they rolled up their windows after that. <laughs> some, of you need, some of you need to outshout the world. That's what you need to do. 
If NFL football, if NFL fans can look like a bunch of idiots for a dumb sport of throwing a little ball and they go, yeah! when somebody just throws a ball, you need to realize that when Jesus Christ is on the throne, you need to shout and go, yeah! Silly little ball. People just lose their minds when a ball is thrown. And when the Holy Spirit is inside of them, they can't give a shout. You need to praise the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what you need to do? You need to get into preaching. That's why you're alive. You know why? You got somebody shouting the sin and the hell fire out of you, putting some life into you. That's why you're still alive. Because you got preacher so-and-so pointing his finger right at you. You need some preaching. And if outside of church, you need to still listen to preaching. There's audios. There are things online. You need to soak in yourself with sermons that will beat the conviction into you and get you alive in Jesus Christ. And what you need, you need to listen to teaching. You need to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more you, you know truth, the more your conviction becomes stronger. Where you will not compromise into anything dead or into the flesh or into the world. That's what happens. It's uncompromising and solid. So that's why you become alive. Another way you become alive is looking at how God changed people's lives. You know, what, you know what makes this preacher keep on going and never close down this church? Is whenever I see, man, I remember brother so-and-so. I remember Tom right there who was Catholic and felt uneasy going to church. But, man, look at him go. He's preaching. He's teaching, man. He's, man, look at him singing hymns. And, man, he's totally against Catholicism, serving God. Look at that. You know, I had three people always, but then came in Sister Barbara, and then she brought in her husband, and her husband eventually got saved. And then I see her husband, Emilio, just trying to witness to somebody in Spanish. And then I see Sister Barbara trying to buy Ruckman reference Bibles for everybody. I mean, boy, that would keep me going, you know. There, there I go, oh, there, there goes Sean, look at him. Oh, he's yelling at some guy who's blaring up his music over there. Oh, that keeps me going. That keeps, you know what, that's why I'll keep going to church. That's why I keep running this church. Look, somebody online said, hey, pastor, thank you for the class you taught because I just led three souls to salvation because of that. Thank you, pastor. I left this heretic who was all over the internet, but you rescued me from that heretic's teaching. I don't believe in the post-tribulation rapture. I don't believe in anti-Semitism or anti-dispensationalism. Now I am I'm a Bible-believing, King James-only dispensationalist. Thank you so much for that. And then I get other people online saying, man, thank you so much. You changed my life. I could cry. I could shed tears. And if I can only sh shake your hand, thank you so much. You don't think that seeing how God changed people's lives, that that doesn't make me alive? I'll be alive if you're not. You know why? Because I've seen God changing so many people's lives. And I can't go back after that. God changed my life for the better. And he can certainly change yours. I remember one day when Satan, he locked up everybody in the, in the prison of sin. And he looked at everybody and he says, you'll never get out of prison. You'll never get out of jail. There's a person who committed lying. And then he put that liar in jail and said, you'll never break out of jail. There's a person who committed the sin of murder. And then Satan locked up that murderer in jail and said, you'll never get out of jail. There's a person who stole something. And the devil put that thief in the jail. He says, you'll never break out of jail. Went to a person who committed fornication, locks up that fornicator in jail. And he says, you'll never break out of jail. And he said that to every individual as he locked them up. You'll never break out of jail. 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 Until one day, Jesus Christ, bless God, he came walking through the jail of sin. And he had the keys of, Delen, of hell and death. And Jesus Christ, he went through every jail cell and unlocked those bars. And as the devil cried out, the devil cried out to every one of them, you'll never break out of jail, you'll never break out of jail. All of a sudden, Jesus cried out, jailbreak! And as those jails started to open up, all those sinners now became set free in Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ went to every jail cell and went, jailbreak, 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 and jailbreak. 
And oh man, I want to thank God. I want to thank God that you, 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 and you, and you used to be in the jail of sin, and Jesus and the devil locked you up. And the devil, I can picture, he was going like this. Oh, you'll never break this one out of jail. You broke those guys out of jail. You'll never break this one out of jail. I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That man, woo! What he started to do is that he started to get those keys. It's like, really? And the devil said, you'll never break them out of jail. You'll never break them out of jail. And Jesus Christ started to tag everyone out of jail. Amen. Jailbreak! And he went jailbreak! Amen. Jailbreak! Amen. jailbreak! And he went jailbreak and jailbreak! And he went jailbreak! Jailbreak! And all these Woo! sinners, they start to run out of their jail cells, give God the glory and say, I am free! I am free! And all of us are now pointing our fingers at the devil and saying, jailbreak! 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 jailbreak that's why we can be alive you know why because ourselves are now alive and free in Jesus Christ God my father thank you so much for your resurrection had it not been for your resurrection we would not be here today we would be dead in trespasses and sins as Ephesians said Thank you that we're alive in Jesus Christ. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.